in-game description of the divine armor type, mostly used in campaign units uh, for Archimond, says divine beings only take damage from chaos attacks. While it should be divine beings take only 5% damage from attack types other than chaos. What is the reason behind this? Discrepancy? No, it's a, it's me being an idiot. <laughs> so I, I have to take responsibility for this because I wrote all the tooltips in the game. And when it came to divine armor, I didn't understand it and no one explained it to me. And because it's only on like one or two units in the entire game, it just didn't get caught. So my mistake is permanent. <laughs> so I wrote divine beings only take damage from chaos attacks because I believe it was described to me that way when I wrote it. And then I just forgot. But writing divine beings take only 5% damage from attack types other than chaos would be a little confusing, so I'd probably rewrite it as divine armor reduces damage from all damage types except chaos. Why is there no playable dreadlords in the undead campaign of the Warcraft 3 Reign of Chaos? Primarily because it was sort of decided that they were all super deceptive and that giving the player control over one would make them less mysterious. So it just never sort of came up in the story that you would ever control a dreadlord because why would a dreadlord who is deceptive and running all these schemes behind your back ever be controllable by you? It just didn't make sense story-wise. So that's one of those things where we avoided ludonarrative dissonance, which is to say when the game doesn't make sense in terms of what it's doing with you and story it's telling. Maybe it's a bit of a missed opportunity. We could, I mean, Metzen could have written a Dreadlord who changes sides or decides to help you out or any number of things, but we just said, yeah. Why can't you build walls in Warcraft 3? So there was debate about this early on in development. I vaguely remember some of it, but effectively it was just that pathing was difficult enough and then adding an additional layer of the player being able to build walls and cause more confusion would have been too much for the pathing. That might have been a cop-out, I think later on because we sort of figured out how to do pathing with like trees being knocked down and then potentially being resurrected and, and things like that. But I think at the time, given the limitations of the specs, maybe it was just too much. Ultimately, we decided that, you know, you could use farms as walls, but I agree that it would have been interesting to have real walls. And I think that it was always kind of a split, but it was just decided that technically it was not achievable at the time. I imagine that could have been changed at some point, but we didn't. In regards to the Warcraft 3 engine, how much of it was used in World of Warcraft? What happened with the Alpha engine? This is sort of two different questions. So the Alpha War 3 engine became the normal engine, so nothing happened to the Alpha engine. And then in terms of how much of it was used in World of Warcraft, all of it. It was literally a code divide, and then now World of Warcraft builds on it. So 100% or at least it started that way. How much of it was stripped out and, and whatnot, I have no idea, but effectively, WoW is Warcraft 3 with a bunch of stuff stacked on top of it, which is quite interesting to think about. <laughs> but if you've ever seen like some of the more complicated user-made maps, I think you can see how that's true. If Mike O'Brien's vision prevailed, do you think that strategy genre would be different today? Yeah, maybe a little bit, but if you think about it, how many RTSs that came after War 3 kind of copied the RPG RTS model that we did. Not many. <laughs> Assuming that they would have ignored it the same way, nothing much would have changed. Would the strategy genre be different today? Potentially, but in ways that I could never possibly fathom. I just don't have that sort of level of backwards prediction. Like, I can't imagine what exactly would be different. Maybe Warcraft 3 would have utterly failed. I don't know. <laughs> How long did it take to make a level in Reign of Chaos and the Frozen Throne? It's a great question with a very complicated answer, but let me break it down as simply as I can, which is to say that if it was a very straightforward map, like let's say that it's basically a few things happen in the story, but no big deal. So it's just going to have an intro and an outro cinematic. And the main part of the mission is that you're going to fight a couple AIs and that's basically it. You know, that's something that would take like one or two weeks, maybe one week or even less just to get it done in some way, especially if it's a smaller map and an early map. If it was a more complicated trigger map and like all sorts of stuff is going on, like the culling, for example, I remember it being almost two full months of me working on so the more that complicated the map, especially if you're like making your own AI and doing stupid shit like that, going to take a long, long time. I know that this question is in relation to planning things out like for uh, people who want to make their own campaigns. I would allot one week for simple maps, two weeks for large simple maps, and then for anything that's like has a complicated premise in terms of like, you know, there's going to be a lot of triggers, dungeons, for example, or you need to have a lot of unique things and events happening and interesting stuff to find, then you want to allot at least four weeks, at least. 
Uh, and if it's a spe specifically a very complicated thing that you're not sure if it can even be done, uh, eight weeks for that map. Have you made any Warcraft 3 maps in your leisure time? No. No, I don't have any side projects or joke maps. Who came up with the jokes in Warcraft 3's ending credits? I often like to play the last mission again because I wanted to see those credit animations. Uh, Alan Dilling uh, made the ending credit maps between him and Sammy and the art team. I think he got a lot of uh, input from them, but generally I think it was Alan Dilling. Previously you mentioned Metzen wrote Warcraft 3 mission stories and scripts and the designers called dibs on missions that spoke to them. Can you talk about that process? Was there ever a fight over a mission? Why did you pick the ones you did? It's hard to remember, but basically I'll describe the process again. We would sit around a table in a meeting room and we would read the dialogue for the missions out loud. We would each take a character, so I would play Arthas or something and, and we would do a reading. And then at the end of that, we didn't necessarily choose right then. It potentially could be assigned to someone. In the case of the culling of Stratholm, it was just a mission that really spoke to me, and so I immediately called dibs. And I remember Scott Mercer getting a little bit upset about it. He's like, I, I didn't think we were doing that. And I'm like, well, I don't know, I wanted the mission. Did you want the mission? And he's like, well, no, but <laughs> I didn't know we were calling dibs on missions. And I'm like, well, now you know. Sometimes it was like, oh, it's a dungeon mission. Uh, Dave should do that. And it would just get assigned to me that way. Like the dungeons of Dalaran didn't particularly speak to me, but because I was known for doing good trigger work and a dungeon mission tends to need good trigger work, then I would get assigned the mission and things like that. And then anything with like a super complicated premise, like, uh, oh, it has to have this wagon cart that moves around on its own and it's not going to be AI controlled. So it all has to be done in the triggers. That would go to Michael Heiberg because he was our uh, lead uh, tech designer, basically. So the, the first part of the decision-making process was basically who would be the best person to do this mission from a can they accomplish it standpoint, and then it would be assigned. Second would be who has strong feelings towards this mission, and then they might grab at it. And then the third consideration would be does no one want to do this mission? Well, who doesn't have enough missions to do? Give it to them. <laughs> and that did happen on a couple of occasions. Though I don't remember any specifics, so, so don't ask. I assume you and other designers were working on levels at the same time. If so, did you ever have a drive to make your levels better than the other designers? Personally, no. I never felt like it was a competition. I always felt like it was a cooperation. I know that not all the designers felt the same way that I did, and there were a few who decided that it was a competition, and then they would get weird about like hiding what they were working on. I just, I'm not down for that. Uh, if I did something cool, I share it with everyone, and I like, never want to, to do the same. There was sort of like a mentality among a few people that like it was like a competition, and the worst level designer would be fired or something like that, but it's, I just don't think that was necessarily the case. And also, it's better for everyone if you're more cooperative and sharing ideas, because like, who cares if you had some cool thing in your map? Like, if it could have been used in other maps too, you should share that and like, then make everyone stuff cooler and then the whole game becomes cooler that way. And I think the more people who have that mentality, the better overall it is for the game. And luckily there was enough people in Warcraft 3 that we were, there was a lot of info sharing between us, except when time did not permit. But you could always go to, to other people for help when you needed it. What were some of the asset limitations you may have had as a level designer? And do you have any examples of how you got creative using something not the way it was originally designed? Oh, it's so hard to think off the top of my head. I know we would do things like, actually, let me show you. Let's go to Dungeons and Bellows. So, there were a couple tricks that we did use. We would repurpose things that weren't necessarily meant to be used that way. Like this, for example. This is actually a super shrunk down <laughs> thing that I put on the table as a model. And then you had to... There's a way to play with the Z-axis. Anyways, that's one of the tricks, is that you could manipulate the Z-axis. Shrinking things up and down in, in like this is meant to be a background thing, not a model on a table. Like I, that's one of my favorite things to do, which, you know, sometimes infuriated the artists because they're like, no, it looks goofy, but whatever. And there are other tricks where you can use special effects to pretend it's like a flame trap. Here I put lightning strikes on the doors when they opened just for fun. Oh, there's a secret there. I forgot about that. And what else? Like the usage of the runes wasn't really a thing. <laughs> I just made it a thing. I've forgotten the question. What were some of the asset limitations? Oh, asset limitations. I think the main thing was just that we couldn't get whatever we wanted. At some point, art was done and we just had to use whatever was there. And so I think I've mentioned this before, but like there are certain items that are obviously like stupid, <laughs> like the slippers of agility, for example. It's like Spider-Man's slippers. <laughs> I don't think those are even going to be used 
and then we just sort of use them for that. And then there's like a there's like a twig that we used for an early item, and those just came from like leftover icons that Sammy had made that weren't used for anything. And there are some quest items that are also basically that, where Sammy had made an icon just for fun. We didn't necessarily know what we needed for the campaign items, and then it was just like, well, you know, art's done in that regard, so just use whatever you got. <laughs> and so we did. There's a lot of them. Most of the keys, I think, ended up that way. There was a period where we spent like almost a whole week just going through all of the random art and like picking stuff out that we could put in and, and use for something. And, and that was cool. Hopefully that answers the question enough. When starting a new level, would you have to do any research on existing locations or other media as reference to the levels you would eventually build? No. <laughs> no, we didn't. Because at the time, you know, what reference was there? For most of these things it was kind of like vague maps and like maybe there was a warcraft 2 level that you could look at but not really for the majority of them we didn't really look at anything for example for Strathholm, i didn't look at anything it was just sort of like off the top of my head this is i guess what it would be a lot of it was sort of like on the fly kind of stuff because either nothing necessarily existed for it or concept art existed or the stuff in the previous game was just so old and archaic that it wasn't worth looking at we probably could have done more due diligence there but yeah uh, if you are making a location that is supposed to be something certainly you should do some research and also when you're initially laying out the map you have to consider all of the things that you need to have happen on the map and you kind of want to build areas for those functions and then build areas in between that's sort of how i would do that how would you play test your levels did you rely solely on qa and their feedback or would you and the other designers play each other's levels and give feedback beforehand whenever anyone completed a level we would have uh everyone play that mission and that continued close to the end of development but at some point it became like we just don't have time to play each other's missions because we need to complete ours and at that point we began to rely more heavily on QA and internal feedback and I think it was around then that the artists were kind of mostly done with their stuff and so most of them will be able to play campaign missions and give feedback and once it's done with the triggers and stuff they would go in and do an art pass and then we would get it back and we'd fix the triggers that they always would break then there would be a sound pass as well. So we relied on everyone's feedback and I think the rushed nature towards the end maybe was detrimental to certain levels because of that. So I wish that we had continued that process the entire time and just taken the time to do it as opposed to rushing through and everyone was like, ah, I just got to finish mine. I can't worry about your stuff anymore. It's not a good attitude, but it was forced upon us by the, the schedule. Will there ever be a Warcraft 4? Well, you know, that's an interesting question right now. <laughs> I think that the possibility of a Warcraft 4 is maybe higher than ever. There's a number of things that need to be answered in terms of how is Microsoft's acquisition of Activision Blizzard going to actually work out. But I would say we won't really know the answer to that for another year. And that's assuming that it goes through at all because there could be like an antitrust case and things like that. All sorts of things could make this fall apart. But I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. And once Blizzard is safer in the arms of Microsoft, I think that the possibility, especially given Phil Spencer's statements about like what sort of games he wanted to see, like he was talking about like, oh, I want to see Hexen. So he's clearly a classic games kind of guy. And maybe that department could be revitalized at Blizzard. But that primarily depends on how Activision and Blizzard are split or if they are split. Like does Blizzard become an independent studio? And then does Microsoft dismantle any Activision employees who are put in charge at Blizzard? Which I think he should do. He should pull them out like the parasites they are. Oops. Oh, that was, that was a hot take. <clears throat> if you had asked me before this acquisition, I would have said there was absolutely no hope of a Warcraft 4. But now that Microsoft has Warcraft in their IP IP base or once that deal is inked and dry and solid and there's no antitrust the possibility of a Warcraft 4 is higher than ever before uh, I don't know the exact statistics of it occurring <laughs> but higher than ever before and that's a good thing I think what studios do you feel evoke the mentality of the old school blizzard you remember the good parts not the toxic stuff this is a good question but difficult to answer until I've worked at those studios what people propose their company culture is as opposed to what it actually is tends to be two different things in terms of like who espouses that mentality of the old school blizzard i think a number of studios do and ironically most of them have been under the microsoft umbrella which is to say that they're owned and funded by microsoft so <clears throat> uh, in exile is a good example i felt pretty good there though obviously didn't 
get to have a permanent job, but oh well. And I'm very excited for what Frost Giant is working on and, and what they could be. I know Tim very well and I'm, we've had discussions and I'm very excited about what the potential is for that studio and the company culture that he portrayed to me and his mentality towards game development are very promising in terms of what Frost Giant could deliver. So those are two examples. In terms of uh, other studios, you know, if I didn't work there, I can't really say. <laughs> I have no idea because they can evoke a certain mentality, but is it real? I don't know. The more I interview with certain companies and people, the more skeptical I become of their future potential to continue to make good games. CD Projekt Red being one of them and Remedy has me worried a little bit. Again, I never worked at those studios, so just one interview is not enough to really tell what a company culture is. You kind of have to work there for almost a year before you're really going to understand what's going on. Though actually I'm getting better at it and I can sort of figure out the company culture within the first few months. That's There's something to be said for that. But until I'm hired there, who knows? Or work with them, which is also potential to have happen. And that's it. That's it. I know it's only 23 questions, but one of them or two of them were basically two questions in one, so I'm counting this as 25, okay? Now that that's done, I think I can solidly say that my part in the Warcraft AMA is absolutely done. I definitely cannot answer the rest of the questions that, that we still have on the books. Tim has promised to take his part in the AMA and answer the questions uh, for campaign design that I can't, and he was the campaign lead, so he can definitely answer more of those questions than I could. And obviously he has his perspective as well. So he may have different answers to some of the questions that I've already answered. So that's exciting. Um, still reaching out, hoping Chris Metzen will take part at some point, but he hasn't responded. Whereas Tim is guaranteed to take part and it's just a question of when he has the time. And unfortunately he's been extremely busy and we just have to respect that and don't harass him, please. So. I hope you enjoyed my final part in the Warcraft AMA. Uh, I will be answering all of the other questions for other games I have worked on and other studios I've worked at and game industry questions. All of that will be answered in time uh, as part of a different series. But uh, I had a lot of fun working with Abelhawk on this one and I'm hoping to continue that even though I won't be in it with more people participating in this Warcraft AMA and I will continue to work on this and try to get people uh, working on it all the way up to July of this year um, at which point it will be the 20th anniversary of Warcraft 3 and then we can I think put this to rest <laughs> and just appreciate all the nostalgic memories but move on with our lives to new games and new greener pastures uh, together. Eh? We'll see, Designer Dave. We'll see. <laughs>